Welcome back. Prime Minister Scott Morrison says Australia has not moved to a COVID-19 elimination strategy by pursuing zero cases. Speaking to News Corp papers, he confessed uh, completing the vaccination rollout does not guarantee a reopening. Joining me live now is Ebony Bennett from the Australian Institute and James Bolt from the Institute of Public Affairs. Good to see you both. Ebony, if I could start with you. Speaking to the Daily Telegraph, we heard the Prime Minister say... Australia's borders will stay shut, even with the vaccines. Do, do you think that most Australians are backing him on this? Yeah, well, actually, the Australia Institute released some polling today uh, that Sky News reported on, showing that around two thirds of Australians do support uh, the border closures. But interestingly, uh, more than half also agree with the statement that Australian citizens should never be deprived of entry back into Australia. So I think there what you can see is probably two decades of quite toxic political rhetoric around the issue of refugees and border control on the one hand, but also uh, many, many Australians being deeply uncomfortable with the idea uh, of not being able to return to Australia, that punitive measures would be uh, pursued against people returning from India when we didn't see that same kind of policy uh, from people returning sick from the United States or the UK. And frankly, the Prime Minister should not be concerned about whether or not this is popular. He has a duty to all Australian citizens uh, and he should uphold it whether or not it's politically popular with the electorate. It's a good point. James, your thoughts on Fortress Australia and the fact that he's also saying that there's not enough evidence on how the current crop of vaccines reduce transmissions, enough of that evidence to wind back quarantine. I was so disappointing, uh, disappointed reading that interview today. I understand Scott Morrison says he was misquoted, but even in his clarifying statements on Facebook, there was absolutely no commitment to when he's going to reopen international borders. Uh, this is just heartbreaking for those of us that have family overseas. We have absolutely no timeline of when we're all going to be reunited. And the fact is, the rest of the uh, world is thinking about opening up. I know European nations are considering having American tourists who are vaccinated coming in in this, you know, just the next couple of months. And we're here is this hermit nation mentality, thinking about how long we can conceivably stay closed. Uh, this is just heartbreaking stuff. And it's just not the way that we can go forward economically or emotionally. And uh, you brought up the vaccine rollout. I just don't get the messaging of why you want to be downplaying what vaccines can do. The evidence is clear from overseas. Vaccines work. They do reduce the risk that COVID-19 po uh, uh, poses to individuals and also limits spread in society. And instead, the only thing the Australian people have been hearing about vaccines over the last couple of weeks is that they cause blood clots and don't even achieve what they set out to do in the first place. Mm. I mean, based on that, why would anyone want to get a vaccine? This is just absolutely not the messaging we need at this time when people should be getting vaccinated. Ebony the, other big news this, Ebony, the other big news this week was the government's India repatriation flights resuming soon, but Aussies wanting to board one of those planes will need to test negative first, effectively, I guess, leaving those sick Australians to deal with an overrun medical system in India. What do you think about that? Yeah, again, this is very appalling. Uh, I mean, Australia has a quarantine system for a reason, so that people who are sick can enter that and still be isolated from the community. And to think that we're just abandoning Australian citizens to a health system that's incredibly overrun and under-resourced and in the middle of, you know, a, a horrific wave of infections there, you know, is, is just really, really appalling and I think it will appall many Australians and uh, you know to agree with James's point there Australia is way behind globally on the vaccination rollout and the reality is with this being a global pandemic until all of us are safe none of us are safe so Australia not only has to be doing much better on its own vaccine rollout which the Commonwealth has been incredibly slow on uh, but we need to be doing much more to get the vaccine uh, out everywhere globally so we can stop more variants from happening. And back here in Australia too, we have to look at our quarantine system. Hotel quarantine has been where the virus is escaping from and still the Commonwealth government uh, has had a whole year and hasn't built any additional purpose-built quarantine facilities here. So, uh, you know, it's relying on the fact that 
uh, we don't have the facilities here for these kind of draconian and appalling measures uh, when it's really only got itself to blame and the situation isn't good enough and I think there'll be a lot of voters out there uh, you know who'll be taking a second look at how the Morrison government is handling this and 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 really seeing that they're, they're not doing a very good job at the moment. James, do you think the PM got it right or wrong here by saying to those Australians with COVID, you know, you're on your own, protecting Australia is more important even with hotel quarantine? This is just shameful. Last week on this show, I read out that the Australian passport literally has a statement in it saying that the bearer of a passport is to be afforded any help of here, which, uh, sorry, any help that the holder is in need of. And I can't think of a more important need than help when you are positive with coronavirus in a country where the hospital system is so overwhelmed that patients cannot even get oxygen. These are the first people that we should be getting back to this country to help them out, not the last. Uh, we have so many hospitals that are free of COVID patients right now who should be able to help out these people, but instead we're leaving them in a country that might not be able to. This is just completely the wrong decision, and I can't believe this is the policy response. All right, guys, we're getting low on time, but Ebony, the, but Ebony, the, the budget, it's coming out on Tuesday. It's a big women-focused budget. They're, they're spruiking lots of spending uh, on Australian women. Do you think this will help address the government's women problem they've had over the past year from what you've heard so far? Yeah, I mean, I guess that remains to be seen of what exactly is in the budget on Tuesday night, but there is no doubt that the Morrison government and Scott Morrison's approval with women uh, has dramatically dropped. Uh, I think we've seen a couple of piecemeal announcements that really kind of pale in comparison to some of the structural issues that we see in the budget. The Australia Institute's own research shows that inherently there are many measures in the budget, many tax concessions and other spending measures that are pretty much sexist. Uh, and so I think announcements like um, potentially making the childcare subsidy up to 95%, that was one of the Australia Institute's recommendations for affordable childcare. Measures like those that are big structural reforms that will allow many more women into the workforce will boost GDP in the long run. That's what the experience in Nordic countries show. But again, a kind of a couple of billion dollars there really pales in comparison to the cost of, for example, $18 billion in income tax cuts that will come in by 2024, two thirds of which are going to go to men and only one third to women and of those mostly high income earners. So while it's good to see a focus on women for a change, uh, I think it remains to be seen how much the budget will actually improve economic security for women in the long run. And James, just quickly in 30 seconds, your thoughts on what you've heard with the budget so far? Uh, so with the housing thing, we saw this with childcare, which is the government can identify this source of problem. Uh, this problem with the source is, sorry, the problem of costs in an industry. And instead of trying to lower the costs, uh, they just try and subsidise things. The fact is housing is held back by red tape. I'm very conscious I'm trying to get this done in 30 seconds. If we can reduce the red tape around building new houses, I think costs are going to come down. And that's when you don't only just see single mums getting back into the housing market. You see, all you see all Australians, which is what I think should be happening. All right, guys, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to chat to you on a Sunday. Ebony Bennett from the Australia Institute and James Bolt from the Institute of Public Affairs. Enjoy the rest of your day. The bottom 20% uh, uh, get nothing. They're really unfair tax cuts. People want to see much stronger action from the government when it comes to climate change. It's no coincidence that we have a wages crisis in Australia. Transitioning to net zero emissions, it doesn't seem like there's much room for gas.